Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, everyone, et bonjour tout le monde. My name is Peter Searles, and I'm in my second year volunteering with the Canadian Science Policy Centre as a program committee member and a co-chair of the editorial committee. Nous sommes très excités de présenter cette session de midi appelée Un Conversation avec Mona Niemer. The CSPC has been very fortunate to have the support of the Office of the Chief Science Advisor over the past few years, and I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion. As always, please tweet and share about your favorite events and panels at the conference using at science policy and hashtag CSPC 2019. It is now my pleasure to introduce the President and CEO of the Canadian Science Policy Center, Mirdad Harari. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Before beginning, aren't CSPC volunteers awesome? Yeah. Well deserved. Thank you. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, merci à tous et à toutes uh, pour être ici. Uh, bienvenue à tous et à toutes qui a commencé cette conférence uh, ce matin. Et j'espère que vous avez passé une excellente journée avec beaucoup de discussions uh, pendant le, uh, au cours de la uh, panel session. It is my absolute pleasure to be here for the session, a conversation with Dr. Mona Nemer, Canada's Chief Science Advisor. Uh, I must say when uh, Dr. Nemer was appointed to the position in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, and she was six weeks on the job and we asked her, and she very kindly accepted our invitation to be with us at the CSPC. Many of you were in the room and we had an excellent chat and conversation. And uh, we very much liked that panel session. She very much loved that session, and our audience loved it. So I must tell you that session uh, repeated last year, and we're uh, repeating it again. And it was very much liked by uh, the audience, and we received excellent feedback. It was one of the most favorite, uh, favorable sessions of the audience in the past surveys. So therefore, we are repeating it again. And uh, since her appointment, we had an excellent collaboration and connection with her office, uh, with herself. And uh, we did a joint project together in partnership, Science Meets Parliament. Many of you know about that. And we are hoping to repeat that again this year, hopefully in the spring. And, and uh, you will uh, hear about this. Um, so I think Dr. Nimmer has been the champion for evidence-based decision-making. She has done an excellent job in connecting with scientific community, with policymakers. And I, uh, from my end, and I'm, I, I think I can speak from, uh, on your behalf too, that we are all proud of what she has done over the course of uh, past two years, and she needs no introduction from me. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mona Nimmer, Canada's Chief Science Advisor. Alors, bon après-midi tout le monde et bon appétit pour ceux qui mangent encore. Euh, bonne digestion pour ceux qui ont fini. Euh, merci beaucoup, Merdad, pour cette, euh, pour cette euh, invitation euh, annuelle. Je vais en dire quelques mots. J'ai trouvé intéressant la façon que tu l'as présentée. Mais j'aimerais d'abord remercier tous les bénévoles qui rendent ce forum et de fait cette conférence possible. Alors, euh, euh, you know, another round of applause, please, for all the volunteers. Um, congratulations for surviving 10 years, a decade, that's quite a milestone. And uh, I think this, uh, you have demonstrated that this, uh, this conference that brings science, scientists, researchers, and policy uh, wonks, I guess, uh, together is uh, extremely important. It's a space uh, for engagement, for um, uh, deliberation, and for collaboration as well. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm celebrating a uh, milestone of my own. Uh, I survived two years, not a decade. And uh, I'm beginning my third year. Yeah. So th thank you, thank you uh, all for your uh, support, for your encouragement. Uh, they mean a lot to me and to my team, uh, both uh, morally and practically as well. So. I think this is a, a team effort uh, to, uh, to help uh, enhance evidence and, and science-informed decision-making in, in this country, and also to enhance science literacy and increase a public trust of science and evidence. And I'll say a little bit more about it in a few minutes. 
So, uh, so Merdad, I, I was very amused how you presented, you know, your, your offer for me to come here. Um, it's after that first meeting, if I recall, you or someone asked whether I would accept to uh, be accountable uh, to the community that I represent and come here for a sort of annual, not checkup, but performance review. <laughs> so I guess I made it through uh, two. Let's see if I make it through the third one. Uh, of course, it's, um, you know, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here to see so many uh, known uh, faces, friends, to make new ones. I'm particularly delighted to see year after year so many young people. It's just so essential that our youth from the policy, from the science sector, get engaged with public life and with the, you know, the issues of this country. So, you know, congratulations to you all. Uh, as you know, um, I am, um, I will be actually announcing our uh, new Youth Advisory Council shortly and I'm certainly very much looking forward to getting advice, to getting perspective from all the young people in the country. So um, I can tell you one thing, after two years, um, you know, more than ever before, I think that it's our collective um, uh, responsibility to ensure that the position of chief science advisor actually remains for the good of the country. It is a value-added colleagues, and we want to make sure that uh, it stays and that, uh, you know, we have a system that the world recognizes, that our politicians recognize, and that our country also uh, recognizes. So uh, on day one, actually, uh, when I was uh, announced, uh, I said that my uh, top priority is ensuring perennity of the office and making sure that I'm the first of a long uh, list of chief science advisors uh, for the country. So uh, as I uh, thought about, uh, you know, back uh, two years ago, what I, what I said, and uh, thinking about perennity, I was, uh, you know, thinking, hmm, perennity, perennial plants, like when I had, you know, when I redid my garden, I wanted to have perennial plants because I didn't want to have to plant every year. I just wanted things that will, you know, prosper, be there for forever. And as many of you who are gardeners or who have gardens know, when you put perennials, um, it's a test of patience because the first uh, uh, years, they actually spend more energy underground than they do above ground. So you don't see the nice flowers, uh, but you, and actually they're sparse before they start just becoming healthy. And you can, you can see the, the product basically of their survival and adaptation to their new environment. And uh, of course, the ones who survive the best, who survive the, the heat and drought of the summer and the harsh winters that we have are the ones that take the most time to actually work underground and make roots. Well, uh, I'm not trying to suggest that uh, we've been un you know, engaging in any underground activities or undercover <laughs> activities, myself or anybody in my team, but we have taken you know, the time adapting to our environment, understanding it, uh, building bridges, uh, building trust, um, seeing what, uh, you know, um, what sort of needs to be done in, and in what priority order in, in, in many ways. So I, am, uh, I hope that you've already seen some of the fruits of, uh, of the office. And uh, I can promise you one thing, I am more committed than ever to making sure that uh, this office is going to be a fixture in the Canadian landscape. So uh, last year uh, was very busy, uh, like I said, uh, underground and uh, above ground uh, as well. And um, so we, we've uh, 
you, you, I don't need to remind anyone of my mandate, but uh, in keeping with uh, the mandate of the office, actually the, our activities were articulated around, I would say, five major themes or, or uh, sectors uh, or streams. Um, first one is open science, which includes uh, both, of course, science integrity and open science. I'll, I'll mention a little bit about that. Uh, science advice, uh, science coordination, very important. Science promotion, uh, which is a topic very close to my heart. And science diplomacy, because the reality is we have a lot to be proud of in terms of science and research and knowledge in this country. And uh, it is my view that we can use uh, our science activities and knowledge uh, to uh, further the interest of our country, both domestically and internationally. So last year, if I very, you know, give you just like very, very brief uh, overview, Last year here, actually, I mentioned to you that it is my recommendation after having um, considered the various science advice systems uh, around the world and uh, the need as well of, uh, of Canada and the government of Canada, it was my recommendation that we actually do create a network of science advisors in um, hopefully one day in all uh, the departments and, and, uh, and government agencies. So I'm very uh, pleased that my advice was actually received positively and that we have indeed started to develop this network. Uh, I saw many of them here, yes, at this table, probably somewhere else. So we have science advisors in, in health, in environment, in Natural Resources Canada, at NRC, at the Canadian Space Agency, uh, soon at the Department of Fisheries and Ocean, and uh, several others. In fact, uh, just two days ago, we had our monthly uh, meeting and there is just so much to do and so much uh, going on. And uh, we even had a, the great uh, privilege of uh, meeting uh, collectively with the science advisors from our ter uh, territories. And uh, again, uh, I think everybody was so pleased uh, to be able to have a strategic conversation and basically be you know, both conveners, translators, uh, brokers of the uh, actions that need to be taken uh, across the country. So um, in terms of uh, advice and advice coordination, uh, for those who were at the opening panel, you heard the, you heard the conversation, I think, of the uh, great panelists that we, we had about the importance, actually, of coordinating science advice in emergencies. And that's why, together with colleagues from various departments um, uh, of the government uh, of Canada, we actually organized uh, not one, but three, um, simul uh, not simultaneous, I guess, uh, they were asynchronous, but uh, trilateral exercises with our colleagues from the UK and the US. I'm happy to say that this is the first time that a tabletop exercise for science advice in emergencies was being carried out in Canada. We have a lot of uh, tabletop exercises for the operations to respond to emergencies, but not for science advice that feeds into emergencies. And I'm happy to say that um, the, uh, I think the realization and the response uh, from the colleagues in the, f in the federal uh, department and those in charge of uh, uh, emergency response has been absolutely uh, uh, great. They've been very supportive. And I guess you don't know what you don't know, but once they saw what they didn't know, now they wanted to have more of it. So I think that's another positive contribution that hopefully we will be making uh, to the safety of all our uh, citizens. I talked about the, the Youth uh, uh, Advisory uh, Council. In terms of uh, coordination and uh, science advice, um, as you know, we have a, um, uh, the Minister of Science uh, has uh, uh, established a Canada Research Coordinating Committee of which I am a member to, uh, to better coordinate uh, science across the different disciplines and the different agencies. 
a, um, a similar, actually, deputy minister uh, level science committee uh, exist uh, within the federal government. In fact, last year it was um, formalized, uh, if you want, and I do participate in um, in uh, the, the the meetings and uh, in fact of the priorities of of this committee. So it gives me a unique perspective and opportunity to know what's happening within the federal uh, science family, uh, outside in our great institutions and be able to hopefully one day bridge these two communities because my, um, my dream is that we stop talking about where science is being conducted in Canada and that we embrace the notion of the sort of one science uh, for, Gana for Canada, recognizing that different institutions and different organizations do have very um, different, perhaps, uh, missions and expectations from the science being carried out, but that together, all this great science and research that is being carried across the country is for one purpose, which is to advance knowledge, to advance the socioeconomic conditions of every Canadian, and for that matter, to advance the bettering of the world as well. Well, on this, I, I was also, uh, we, we tried an experiment uh, uh, together at uh, actually the instigation of the Deputy Minister of, uh, of Environment, uh, Steve Lucas, who's now uh, the Deputy Minister of Health. Um, we co-chaired a science coordination group for climate change that resulted already in some joint uh, programs between ANSERC and uh, different government uh, departments. And uh, I really hope that we're going to see more of this type of coordination and, and these programs. Um, last by, but not least, you know, the government of Canada also established an advisory council on artificial intelligence that uh, uh, has members from uh, both uh, academics, experts, as well as the private sector, um, multidisciplinary uh, lawyers, uh, legal scholars, ethicists, uh, as well as technical uh, experts. I think that um, Canada has, you know, has earned the right to brag about artificial intelligence, but uh, having uh, been among the, the first and still being among the best is not a guarantee that we will uh, remain this way or that we will be able to uh, benefit our country and our citizens from all these great advances. So I think that we have a collective, um, a collective responsibility to, um, um, to, to, to look beyond our, uh, our labs and our uh, experiments and to engage in, in public uh, dialogue. Which brings me to open science, science integrity, and science um, outreach. So um, as you know, last year, um, actually, this year, Janu uh, starting January 1st, all government uh, departments for, uh, for the first time, for the first time, imagine, actually have a science integrity policy that um, frames the responsible conduct uh, of work within the walls of the federal government, meaning that it establishes both the responsibilities and the privileges of the scientists but also of the employer. So this has been, um, I think, a, a great development and uh, one that we can all be, I think, very proud of. We did it in a record time by, uh, by government, I guess, timelines. And um, I think this, it's really important because in this uh, integrity policy, and it, it was actually the number uh, one um, uh, uh, mandate that I was given was to ensure that uh, science is actually open to the public and that scientists can uh, speak about their work. Uh, I don't need to convince this audience why this is uh, so important. Uh, it's important to brag about, uh, about science, to brag about uh, our accomplishments. Um, the fact that our uh, great universities many of them improved in the international ranking, I can tell you, 
has been noticed everywhere. The first question that the science advisor in Japan asked me when I met him is, how did you guys do it? And um, it's of course a, a, a source of great pride for all of us, for all Canadians, but it's also a source of economic prosperity, of attracting the best talent uh, to this country. Uh, the same way that we have great science happening in our uh, great academic institutions, there's great science happening in our federal labs. And one of the uh, privileges that I've had as a chief science advisor is to visit many of these, of these labs. Um, things I didn't know actually existed. Uh, all the great labs for uh, the Department of Fisheries and Ocean um, and, and Environment Canada, uh, at, on both in, uh, in BC and in uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. The Forest uh, Center uh, for NRCAN in, uh, in Edmonton. The, the, the absolutely marvelous, actually, Center for Agricultural Research of uh, Agriculture Canada in Saskatchewan, and the list goes on and on. He, I mean, here in, in Ottawa, the great work being done at, uh, at DND, at uh, so many labs, at NRC, of course. So, um, you know, all this made me um, even more determined to encourage everyone to talk about science. And again, as we talk about the science that we do, we're also explaining why we're doing it. And uh, you all know that the great challenges that we are facing are going to require more knowledge, more science, but also more application of science and technology to societal problems. But if we don't have the trust of the public, and if we don't have the social license to deploy these uh, technologies and these disruptive technologies, these advances in science, then all the work and all the aspirations that we have as we are carrying out our discoveries and uh, you know, seeing our breakthroughs will just be a source of great disappointment to all of us. So in the past uh, few weeks, we heard a, a young lady uh, talk a lot about listening to scientists. Well, listening to scientists assumes that scientists are actually speaking not only to scientists, but also to the public. Uh, it assumes that we're engaging in a dialogue, not in lectures, with the public, that we're listening, we're understanding their concerns, and we're trying to um, explain the knowledge and the science uh, in simple terms that they can relate to. So I just wanna uh, you know, close and say how uh, delighted I am to be here, how much I'm looking forward to taking your questions. I promise it's not gonna be like a question period in parliament, I'll try to answer. <laughs> Alors, uh, c'est encore une fois un immense plaisir d'être avec vous. Uh, je voulais juste partager certaines de mes réflexions plutôt que de vous faire une liste de, de tout ce qu'on a fait. Et je vous laisserai donc uh, la chance de, nous, de me poser des questions et j'essaierai d'y répondre du mieux que je peux. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, can I call you Mona? Of Mona? course. Okay, what, what else is my name? Uh, <laughs> Dr. Mona, <laughs> thank you, Mona, for this uh, insightful but long speech, which I didn't expect, and I have to cut many of the so, questions. So I, I learned <laughs> from the politicians, you know, use the time to that say what you want to say, yes, not right. to answer the questions. <laughs> so they had some in positive impact anyway. Um, once again, thank you very much for being here. Um, there are, uh, I had many questions about the things that you discussed, so I cut them off so that uh, we have extensive time for the audience to ask their questions. Uh, but uh, before going to my questions about the things that you mentioned, uh, a big elephant in the room, we just had an election and uh, a new mandate for the government will begin officially soon, I guess, and it is a minority government. Um, would, you, would you think that your advice will be taken 
and requests it as frequent as it was before and would be implemented? Well, well you know, my, my, my position uh, is not partisan and should remain this way, right? Um, governments, whether majority or minority, need to enact some legislations to make decisions, and we all hope that, you know, irrespective of the color and the size, th th this will be grounded in, uh, you know, science and in evidence. Um, so I'm not gonna crystal ball, but I can tell you one thing that, um, you know, uh, over, over the past two years, uh, we're being asked uh, more questions. Uh, our advice is being, you know, thought after more at earlier stages in the decision-making process. Um, and I think listened to from time to time. So, uh, well, I'll tell you, I guess, next year, if people have listened or not this year. So we'll have you here next year and ask <laughs> that question again. But uh, have you received any phone call or something from Prime Minister's office or any other uh, leaders of the political parties? Merdad, as I was walking here, I got a phone call from the Prime Minister saying, please make sure to say hi to Merdad and everyone <laughs> at CSPC. That's good. But by the way, you should have let him know that we invited him, but he didn't show up. Well, I guess he was <laughs> But he busy. was busy, that's right, that's good. Okay, um, that's good. So um, was it like question period, by the way, the answer? <laughs> okay, so um, I think uh, you mentioned something about the uh, DAI. Well, I mean, on, on, on a serious yes, note, no, you that's know. Okay. <laughs> Like if, if, if we, we forget about the, sure. the, the election, yeah. yes, I have a, I, I've had a very uh, actually you know, uh, constructive and regular interaction okay. with the Prime Minister and his office. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the other leaders have not reach, reached out you know, to me, but uh, yet. yet. Yeah, okay. yes. Hopefully so. Yes. We uh, answer we send all the calls to them that, that we get. There you go. They have your telephone number anyway. Uh, maybe not the personal one, but the office the, the for office sure. One. Okay, that's good. Okay, uh, so you mentioned about the artificial intelligence and uh, you are part of the uh, Government Advisory Council for AI and given the impacts of the AI on societal issues and uh, many unprecedented ones. Um, what is your advice as a Chief Science Advisor to make sure that Canada remain as a leader uh, in the AI research and uh, technology? Well, uh, I, I mean, there are just a long list, I think, but uh, the most imp important one is that as we continue to, um, you know, d to develop the, the, the algorithms and, and so on, uh, and that we look at the applications of AI to so many, um, you know, diverse sectors from health to the oceans, environment, et, et cetera, I think we need to engage in a, uh, you know, parallel, constructive, and serious dialogue mm -hmm. with the public. Uh, I am a great fan of what was done in Quebec in terms of engaging a public dialogue with the community of going to where the public is, not bringing the public where we are, uh, to answer their questions, to um, explain that, um, you know, people are, we think, it's a, we think AI, and robotics, you know, are, are great advancement. Well, some people think they're gonna lose jobs. Uh, some people think that, uh, you know, s somebody's gonna control their brains and, and uh, so on. So I think that we have to respectfully engage in a pub public dialogue. And in parallel, we have to make sure that our, um, you know, innovation system that, uh, that you know, we, we enable the uh, socio-economic applications of AI here in Canada for you know the, the betterment of the economy and society. Okay. So lots to do. But uh, but I thought that uh, uh, Alan Bernstein was here in the room, so maybe he wants to answer. <laughs> okay, that's good. Later we'll, we'll get into that. And uh, in terms of uh, this uh, discussion we had last year, I remember about the uh, network of science advisors and I asked why we need these network of science advisors and this is apparently moving well, which is great news. Uh, but uh, um, I wanna ask you, uh, you your feeling about what kind of impact they might have in policy making within departments and uh, what more needs to be done? Well, uh, yeah, a lot needs to be done. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think uh, that uh, the science advisors uh, in the departments are already having a, a major uh, impact. And again, on the 
you know, with a theme that you don't know what you don't know, what you're missing, right? It's great now that I get uh, actually spontaneous uh, comments from the deputy ministers uh, saying how much they, you know, enjoy working with, uh, with their uh, science advisor and, uh, you know, how they're trying to actually bring down walls within department between different branches but also between departments. And that's something that's just so important. Somehow over the years we seem to have, you know, erected walls everywhere, you know, within our universities, within our institutions, across institutions. And we, we need to all work together to bring down actually these barriers and these walls. Excellent, so um, uh, you know that we have recru recruited one of the science advisors to the CSBC volunteer, we're so proud of him, and to gradually recruit others to work with us on that thing. So um, uh, uh, you mentioned about the open science roadmap, and you mentioned the importance, and I think everybody in this room agrees on that. Uh, can you tell us uh, where you are with that roadmap and when we see the, the full agenda? Well, um, as, as many of you know, the, um, uh, the, the granting councils have had a sort of uh, open publications uh, and data management uh, policy that we've heard a little bit uh, about in the, in the past uh, few weeks uh, about the fact that it's plus ou moins uh, enforced and so on. And the reality is, uh, you know, uh, our aim was to, um, you know, to have the science open, but we didn't uh, provide the tools, we didn't provide the support uh, for our researchers uh, to, uh, to enable them, basically, to, uh, to, to comply. And, uh, of course, within uh, the government uh, of Canada, we, we, we don't have really any uh, policy. Um, my, my view is uh, that, well, number one, my observation is that Canada is a little bit behind uh, other advanced, uh, you know, research-intensive nations in terms of the, our efforts for, for open uh, science and uh, open data and that we're sort of playing catch up. Um, it's, it's also my view that we need to have uh, maybe a, um, you know, a, a, if not a uniform, but certainly a uh, harmonized uh, policy, both for the research that's conducted outside the government and the one inside the government. So, uh, so I've had an expert uh, group that made uh, recommendations and uh, uh, actually we're putting this together in nice forms and translating and we should be in a position to put out our recommendations for the for how Canada can actually um, you know go about uh, open open science and starting with open publications um, I think this will require a lot of consultations both with the you know within government uh, scientists and and outside and I think there are a lot of you know, sort of misconceptions and fears uh, sometimes about what it means or doesn't mean. So uh, we're going to need to engage in, in this dialogue. I think open science is extremely important for public trust. Uh, and we're going to have to think also how we uh, perhaps in addition to all the data and the scientific publications, how do we come out on the vulgaris? How do we, you know, put maybe a sort of uh, a summary that is for public consumptions uh, to, you know, enhance understanding and participation. Thank you. So I want to ask one more question and then uh, we'll, um, uh, open the floor for more questions. Um, so you have been in this position for slightly more than two years, and how much do you think that your position, Chief Science Advisor, uh, has impacted overall policy making within the government? You know, Merdad, like I said, I, I think you should, n n you know, ask this maybe to the politicians, the decision makers. They don't and, answer and sometimes. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, I, I would say, you know, humbly that I, I think I have made a difference that we see uh, in, in several, de you know, decisions that have been taken, um, at least some of the advice that has been uh, provided. Uh, I can certainly name our recommendations uh, for the uh, you know departmental science advisors for the aquaculture, um, our our uh, rev uh, review and recommendations for the process that that was underlying the the food guide. I mean a number of others, and as you know, there is formal and informal uh, advice. So 
um, I mean, I'm certainly feeling, uh, you know, good about it, that uh, there has been uh, receptivity uh, for the advice. And I hope that, uh, you know, as, um, you know, trust uh, continues to, to develop, that there will be, you know, even more and more uh, proof of it. And uh, as a follow-up and last question, what uh, you hope to accomplish in the next 12 months so that at the next CSPC we uh, hold you accountable for that when yeah. you come back? Uh, it, it, this is like beyond a performance review now. <laughs> this is like setting <laughs> objectives. <laughs> well, you know, we, we have the, the open, uh, the, the roadmap for, for open science that we're, uh, that we're uh, working on. I think this is a big piece. This is very important. We're going to continue to, to deploy the, uh, the network of, uh, of science advisors. This is extremely important. And I think like all of you, we're, uh, you know, uh, we're looking forward to hearing the uh, speech from the throne to, to understand uh, you know, the, the more maybe specific, uh, um, I guess, priorities of government that will likely be uh, engaged uh, in. But I mean, you know, when we think about um, you know z the commitment to zero emission by 2050, you can only imagine how much I think science and science advice, um, you know, will need to be brought to the table and uh, the complexity of the of the issues and the ramifications on so many sectors. I think we'll be busy. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll prepare questions for next CSBC, mm -hmm. and now it's open uh, uh, floor for questions. Uh, uh, from anyone, please. There are two microphones on the two sides of the uh, of the room, and uh, and please identify yourself if you like, and then ask your question. We can get started, please. Hi, uh, Matt McLeod, government scientist. Here, happy to have dialogue with anyone who wishes. Um, my question for you, Dr. Namer, I have great respect how focused you've been to accomplish clear things in the in your uh, limited time in, in this office so far. I'm wondering, looking forward, do you see, assuming it would come with resources, are there areas you'd like to see your mandate uh, expand or change or different areas you'd like to cover? Or do you think your mandate's sort of about right where it is? Uh, you mean my office? Correct, yeah. Well, um, you know, uh, do, do you work at Treasury, you said? <laughs> no, at, uh, at the Department of Defense, actually. L look, like I'm gonna be very candid because you know <laughs> ma many colleagues in government, you know, have said, have, have have told me quite frankly, they they didn't know, you know, actually what we're going to be doing, how how much money we're gonna need, how much resources uh, we're going uh, to be needing, and I certainly wasn't going to, you know, start asking for for more resources before I knew what I needed to do. Well, I can tell you I have a pretty good idea of what, uh, what needs to be done now. And uh, as, a, as a scientist and a biologist, I guess I always mm -hmm. said, uh, you know, form has to follow functions. And so here we are, but uh, you know, if you wanna advocate for more resources for us, thank you very much. <laughs> Next question. Hi, it's Alyssa Strom. Uh, I'm executive director of the Pan-Canadian AI strategy at CIFAR, so I wanted to get back to your questions around AI and Canada's leadership. Alan, I'm afraid he was here earlier in the day, but he had to step out for lunch, so I thought I would uh, step in and uh, address them. Um, so, you know, I really appreciate the question, and I really appreciate your leadership on this, uh, this topic, Mona, especially around advancing the public dialogue and discourse on AI, and it's something that we believe very strongly at CIFAR is a critical component um, of, of Canada's opportunity for success. But another area that I think is a critically component for Canada to remain a leader in AI is to continue to build very strong, diverse AI ecosystems. This means investing in talent, it means investing in fundamental research, and as you said, Mona, investing in the applications of AI and really understanding how they can have uh, social and economic benefits. Uh, one of the things that's really critical in AI in Canada and around the world right now is ensuring that we have equity, diversity, and inclusion in AI. Just as we need it in science broadly, we need it especially in AI. And it's something that uh, will be an important part of the public dialogue and an important part of the work that all of us uh, in the AI ecosystem need to really focus on in the years ahead. Thank you, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think that uh, the, the notion that uh, or the efforts for the for the diversity uh, are especially important for uh, for AI because uh, the last thing that we need is to uh, 
perpetuate and amplify actually through the existing you know algorithms uh, you know biases so I, I completely agree on this next question Trisha. hi this is Trusha Patel University of Lethbridge um, I'm one of the Canada Research Chair in Biophysics, and my question to you and all the funding agencies, so SHORC, CHR, and NSERC who are here, um, we are talking about open access, open data, making science available to everybody. I think there's a major problem in the system. So if I calculate the amount of money I had to pay the last three years for my publications, it'll be over $40,000 plus. This is one researcher uh, in small university, if you talk nationally, this will be millions of dollars every year. So the question is, do we have a funding mechanism to pay for open access charges? Because the government funding agencies, as you know, they, the money, there's not money enough in the system for us to pay for the charges. So could the government sign contracts with the major funding uh, with the publishers that if the publications come from Canada, either you have a discount or the government pay for the charges. I think this will significantly impact Canadian science all over the world. This is the major problem right now. There's not enough money in the system. Look, thank you for your question. And I, com I, underst I completely understand uh, the, you know, the, 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 the problem I, uh, as a researcher myself, as someone who has vice was vice president research, during which time I actually you know, provided a fund for researchers at the University of Ottawa to help uh, you know, make uh, their publications open. So yes, we need uh, perhaps uh, to have a, uh, uh, not only a, a strategy, but, but also the resources. I think asking for, for money at, at this stage, uh, it's not that it's premature because we can always you know, pay and, and have the, the publications open. But I think that we have to follow the example of other countries that have you know, gone about it in maybe a more strategic and thoughtful way. So the question is, uh, you know, how do we want to, to support this through you know, green, green uh, uh, open uh, access uh, publications, making deals with the, with the major um, publishers. There, there are different, uh, different ways about going about it. And that's exactly what you know, we need to be looking at. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the tremendous uh, support and conversations that I have had actually with a lot of colleagues around the world from the Wellcome Trust U to the UKRI, CNRS, uh, uh, European uh, uh, Commission. Um, they've all you know, been very helpful to us. They've uh, you know, proposed to, to come and, and talk to us. I think importantly, we need to be part of the international you know, coalition and movement, we wanna make sure that we're on the right side of history on this one. Just a comment and, uh, that you can ask the question in French, if you want. Uh, next one on the right here. Bonjour, hi, uh, Majid, uh, senior scientist from Oz Optics. Uh, I have a question. Uh, since uh, you are planning for having a science for public and uh, some activities for the introducing science and the new waves of science to the public, I have a question. Do you have any kind of the strategy for science for politician? <laughs> because the politician and their family also somehow should be uh, you know, exposed to the science, exposed to the, you know, something like, not in the high level, but in the, at least in the low level side that know that what is exactly, you know, for example, global warming, uh, warming or AI and other things. So do you have such kind of the also program for them? Well, thank you. Um, well, th thank you. This is, uh, I mean, we, of course, we, uh, we take it for granted that the politicians are members of the public. They, they do represent the public, but um, Merdad mentioned the sort of pilot, very successful pilot experiments that we did about science meets parliament. Uh, I'm very much looking forward, you know, to, to a repeat of this. And in fact, to, to, to ha having a, you know, um, a, re a repeat on the same theme, if you want, I believe that, um, you know, pub uh, engagement with uh, politicians between scientists, researchers, um, you know, uh, discoverers, knowledge uh, holders, needs to be an ongoing, ongoing effort not only focused about uh, asking for money, but really as being, you know, part of the conversation. It's, it's just like, you know, an educational um, uh, exercise. It's, it's really important. We haven't done enough of it in this country. 
and we need to do it in, in a systematic way. It's not only when there is a crisis that we rush to them. You know, you heard yesterday, you, you need to build the trust, you know, in peaceful times, uh, so that when there is crisis, first of all, they, they listen to you, and also they look, you know, for help from you. So I'm, I'm a big fan of this, and uh, I really hope that many organizations uh, and, and groups will continue engaging in this dialogue. Je m'excuse, Merdad, je parle juste un petit peu de français, so I'm going to ask my question in English. My name is Andrew Harris. I'm a co-chair for the editorial and website committee uh, for the CSPC. So, Dr. Namer, thank you very much for continuing to come back to CSPC. We very much appreciate it. You talked a lot about open science, and this question is going to be very similar to what uh, Trushar just asked, but I want to take a slightly different uh, angle. Um, so, you know, publishing open science uh, you know, publications is very important, but also you mentioned um, the lay reports, uh, so these lay summaries. And I think this is a really important aspect to get the important information into the hands of the public in a form that they can digest uh, and understand. So is there a uh, incentive mechanism that uh, your office has in mind for uh, the future? Well, I'm sure that we'll, we'll, we'll find the, you know, the, the appropriate help from, uh, you know, our office and other places when, you know, when, when, when there are some great initiatives. So, you know, you m made me uh, wonder whether we need a sort of uh, Reader's Digest uh, publication of, uh, of, 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 of science uh, publications. I think it's something that we need maybe to give some thought to. I think you should suggest that to Science Magazine. That would be excellent. <laughs> uh, Dana? Um, my name is Daryl Copeland. Um, nice to see you again. <clears throat> I teach and consult and write about issues related to science, technology, diplomacy, uh, and international policy. You mentioned in your opening remarks that science diplomacy was something of a preoccupation for you. And I attended uh, an event at Global Affairs Canada last spring uh, where you and the Governor General uh, and uh, the Science Minister um, gave a collective presentation on the issue of science diplomacy. Y you probably know once upon a time Canada was really quite active in this area. Think about the Montreal Protocol, think about the Acid Rain Treaty, think about the first framework conventions on biodiversity uh, and climate change. I mean, these were all Canadian initiatives. Um, there has been very, very little uh, coming out of the government or the Department of Foreign Affairs or the Foreign Ministry in, in the intervening period, which is now decades. Um, there is no science advisor at Global Affairs Canada. There is a science and technology division, but it's on the trade and commerce side of the department and exists basically to promote the sale of Canadian widgets and technical services abroad. Um, the department doesn't have an international science policy, um, and it's not practicing science diplomacy. Now, you said that science diplomacy is of interest to you, and in the spirit of assessing performance, um, I'm wondering how you think we're doing on that file, because in my estimation, uh, given the importance attached to this issue, by other governments and other foreign ministries, uh, we are way, way, way behind. Well, uh, I said that uh, you know we have a lot to brag about, and that we uh, we have to use science to advance the interests of uh, the country. It's something I uh, profoundly believe uh, in. Uh, I don't disagree, um, you know, with you on, on the fact that we have underused uh, science diplomacy, perhaps in, 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 in recent uh, memory. Uh, I have, uh, um, you know, a, a expressed the, 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 the dream that Canada will be known in the 21st century for, for science diplomacy leadership, much like we were, we, we were known in the 20th century uh, for our, uh, you know, peace, uh, peace troops. Uh, you'll be pleased, though, to, uh, to know that uh, I've had uh, continuous and, uh, you know, I would say extensive engagement with, uh, 
global affairs uh, on both the foreign affairs and the trade side, uh, that there is uh, increasing appreciation uh, for the role of science in, um, in diplomacy. Um, it, it's, I think, one of those things that is moving, um, you know, slowly but surely in, in the right uh, direction. Uh, I think that we have uh, support uh, in many places, that, uh, including, at, you know, with, with, with the clerk of the Privy Council um, to, you know, uh, pay uh, attention again to, to science uh, uh, diplomacy. So um, I can only say that I'm very hopeful. Uh, in the past year myself, I've engaged in some of a kind of science diplomacy at, at various levels, but, um, you know, uh, together with the European uh, Union, Canada actually co-organized the G7 uh, meeting on microplastics. Uh, we were uh, actually successful in convincing France to uh, organize a, fol a follow-up meeting this year uh, during their G7 presidency. There is a collective action that will, will follow in terms of, uh, you know, standardizing, sampling, methodology, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, I think it's very, very positive. And in my um, last year's annual report, I, I did suggest that we need to have an international science uh, policy. And uh, I'm hearing more about, about it uh, in government circles uh, and not only at global affairs and various, at uh, the level of various science departments, I said, et cetera. So all I can you know, say at this stage is, you know, I'm gonna continue to push in that direction, but uh, I am very hopeful. Thank if you. I can, Mergette, if I can just add one thing. Very um, quickly there, very, 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 thank very, you. Very, very quick. Five seconds. Um, were the government to um, introduce a science diplomacy dimension into its feminist foreign policy, it strikes me that it could make enormous use of you, Kirsty Duncan, Julie Payette, um, and, uh, and, uh, and the former foreign minister, who I think is likely to be the next foreign minister. I don't like the term girl power, but talk about girl power. This is a tremendous and very unused instrument, which is at the government's disposal. And, and I think that there are many, many scientists who are, you know, ready to help in this effort. So thank you for your, your, your confidence, and uh, I look forward to working with everyone on this. Thank you. So we have uh, two more questions. Please, you two ask your questions, and then we provide the answers to two of them. Uh, I think it was uh, your turn, and then the last one. Yes, Great. please. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to make this short. Um, my name is Dominique Hush. I'm a Mary Curie Fellow at uh, Carleton University. I work... Um, quite a bit on open science. I was very pleased to hear you um, talk about the importance of transparency and openness um, within our Canadian institutions, both um, within government and uh, at universities. Uh, clearly from the questions that were asked previously, I think it, it matters a lot to people. Um, it's also nice to see that the government of Canada has been investing um, over half a billion dollars in um, a national uh, digital research infrastructure strategy. Um, there is a very, um, interesting paper that came out recently in the journal um, Nature Scientific Data, and the title was essentially that psychology, not technology, is the greatest challenge to um, data sharing. And so Canada is obviously moving forward on the front of infrastructure, but what are we doing and, and are there any initiatives within your office to um, change the culture and educate and train people on the importance of transparency and openness and data sharing? Thank you for cutting your question short, by the way. Yeah. That was. Th th <laughs> thank you, thank you, and actually, congratulations on having such a prestigious award. Bravo. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, you know, the, the short answer is uh, I, uh, I completely agree. That's why we're doing the consultations, uh, because if you think it's difficult at the level of open publications, try open data, <laughs> where people just feel so possessive of their of their work and their data, but. Uh, you, you know, and at the University of Ottawa, I managed to convince the, the researchers that uh, it's better if, you, if we have uh, uh, shared uh, course facilities, so you put your microscope at, don't think about it that you're losing part of your microscope, think of it that you're gaining uh, part of other people's equipment. So I think that we, we need a lot of these conversations and we're gonna need a lot of uh, champions. Uh, everywhere for, for, open, uh, for open science and, and the open strategy. And uh, 
I hope we can count on you and many others to help us on this. Thank you. Last question. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is actually in response uh, or uh, following up on the question about um, open, open publishing. Um, so I'm the executive director of the Canadian Research Knowledge Network. We, um, we actually uh, do have a very good infrastructure in Canada for licensing uh, digital research uh, on behalf of our university libraries and negotiating that collectively for Canadian university libraries. And I think we, we really are at a tipping point and have an ability right now to actually leverage that negotiation capacity and to work together with the funding agencies and with yourself um, and the research community in general to be able to negotiate um, APCs as part of that, uh, that overall negotiating capacity so that we can strengthen our open access participation in Canada in the way that our colleagues in Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden have done already. And I think we're really at a place where we are, we are able to do that today. Yeah, yeah um, um, I, I know the organization very well. I, I think very highly of you guys. And uh, uh, when the time comes to negotiation, we're certainly going to, to put you in front of the publishers, not me. <laughs> Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the uh, conversation with Dr. Mona Nemer, Canada's Chief Science Advisor, and we are very much looking forward to have her uh, the next uh, CSBC with harder questions and tougher questions and, and accountability. I think you all agree with me that I think the performance uh, review was right. very good, and we can uh, have a big round of applause for Dr. Mona Nemer. Thank you very much, Mona and Mayor Dad, for this amazing conversation and for sharing us all the strategies and practices being championed by your office. I think I can say for all of us that we're very excited to see you here again next year for your next check-in. Thank you all for attending this lunchtime session. We'll now have our afternoon panels beginning in a couple minutes and running until our afternoon coffee break at 2.50 p.m. A reminder to everyone that our excellent exhibitor booths are located in the conference ball ballroom foyer around the corner. And for those of you who have purchased gala tickets, the pre-gala reception will be beginning at 5.30 tonight in the Shaw Center. Thank you very much.